the house service type stuff. The minority is in the manufacturing. And when we think about these sectors, which of these generally pay better? Manufacturing compared to domestic services and agriculture. And actually, when we look at child injury rates, so it's not even like, oh, well, they get paid better, but it's the dangerous machines at the factory. Actually, injury rates are higher in agriculture. Bob. So it is horrible that children have to work, but that's a state of the level of development some of these countries are in. Taking away the child labor option by banning the products that come to us, throw them out of the manufacturing center, and result in them going into <coughs> worse alternatives. Is that the, data from Oxfam? No, this is from World Bank. Uh, you can get it, I'm sure Florida State subscribes to it, you can get it from the uh, World Development Indicators online. Big cure for child labor, raising incomes. If you get up to 11,000 per capita income average in your country, child labor virtually disappears. Uh, that's these first two groups here. Virtually no children work in countries that have incomes over $11,000. Uh, after you get under that, you see a little bit of child labor, about 5% of children. It's really not until you get down to the poorest fifth of countries, countries that are basically average income between $600 and uh, $2,000, in that group of countries, nearly a third of children work. That's your problem for child labor is poverty. What we need to do to get rid of that is raise incomes in those countries, not ban the child labor. If you get the incomes going up, the child labor will disappear. But isn't it labor laws? Isn't it wealthy countries just have labor laws that stop children from working? Yeah, most of them do, but the laws about labor laws for children and other things, largely didn't lead the process of development. They followed it. So the first child labor law in the United States was in Massachusetts, actually. It was 1942, excuse me, 1842. What it did, children un under 12 years old were not allowed to work for more than 10 hours per day in a factory. Is that a restriction on child labor at all? In England, what it said was children under nine couldn't work inside factories. They, published, they passed that one in 1833. National child legislation law in the United States didn't come into much later, 1938. By that time, we had a GDP per capita of about $10,000. Going back to what I just showed you, that's once you're up here and child labor's virtually disappeared anyway. This is what we see when we look at the history of the progressive era. In the early 20th century, when a lot of these laws were passed, they were basically codifying industry practice. As productivity went up, the upper bound was going up with the process of the development, workers started demanding more of their compensation in terms of the other things that we value. Health, safety, vacation time, shorter working hours. All of these things are normal goods. As your income goes up, you demand more of them. The laws came in when we're at levels of income much higher. It's a mistake to look at the United States, Great Britain, or another developed country today and say, other countries need laws like ours. No, let's compare them at a same per capita level of GDP and say, what do those countries look like, or what did we look like when we were as poor as they were? Otherwise, if you mandate standards that a first world country is going to have basically happening anyway, what you end up doing is cutting the process of development short in these other countries. So that's the real key for the process of getting rid of sweatshops, is that of economic development. They're not new. I started this talk by telling you about some of my ancestors who worked in them here in the United States. What gets rid of them? The proximate causes are more capital for workers to work with, better technology, and improving the skills of the workers themselves, the human capital. And how did that process play out in the United States and Great Britain? In the United States, depending exactly when you want to date the start and end to it, it's roughly a little over 100, 120 year process. In Britain, maybe 120 to 140 year process. Why was it faster in the United States than Britain? What fueled the United States Industrial Revolution? The British Industrial, the British Industrial. How did the Americans learn how to do the, do the different weaving technologies? They stole the technology from the British, literally stole the technology from the British, right? So they imported foreign technology. Where did a lot of the investment funds in the United States come from? Great Britain. So we had foreign investors bringing us capital. That's why it happened faster in the United States, or one of the reasons it happened faster in the United States than Great Britain. What were the sweatshop countries in 1950? If we made a list of countries that used sweatshops in 1950. Japan, maybe. Singapore. Singapore. And Korea. Korea. Spain. No. Taiwan. <laughs> but we were on a hot streak. Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan to some extent. 
What are those countries today? Wealthy first world countries. For them, it was about a generation, generation and a half process, much quicker than the U.S. and Great Britain. Why? Because the world had so much more technology, so much more capital. And here's the thing. As they got their institutions right, that capital and technology flowed in, and the process of development happened faster. In some of these countries that have sweatshops today, we're seeing that process happening very rapidly. Other ones, we're not seeing it happen as rapidly. And this is more about what under underlying or fundamental causes of growth are that I'll get to in a bit. Uh, but basically, the process of sweatshops, the very sweatshops that are there, are part of their solution because they bring in the things that bring you higher standards of living. Technology, physical capital. Now, in the Facebook pages for this, some people had some creative little pictures of me that they spoke in. <laughs> this was my particular favorite. <laughs> Benefits from white privilege and denies it. Advocates sweatshops and third world growth. Um, the second part is definitely true. I do think sweatshops are the best available alternative in the short run for most of the workers who are in them, and that they're part of the process of third world growth. But the first part, I want to rephrase, I want to call it white privilege. What I call it is benefits from inheriting a capital stock and technology that my ancestors labored to give us. I.e. white privilege. <laughs> there are people with brown skin, there's people with brown skin, black skin, and lots of colored skin who are in America. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. What matters is you're living in a country that has the capital stock and the technology that provides you that standard of living. It's not about skin color. It's about being around the other human capital, technology, and physical capital. So do I benefit and all of you benefit from that? Absolutely. It's not something to deny. It's unfortunate that other parts of the world don't have a history that built up that capital stock, but this process of industrialization <laughs> and sweatshops that they're going through is building it up for future generations, just like prior generations did here. So I actually like this picture. I might keep it for future presentations, but for right now it's special for Florida State. <laughs> so what good can activists do? So my main answer to you, by the way, is the process of economic development and growth is what gets rid of sweatshops. It's a process we don't want to cut short. That said, of course we want better things for the workers, so the question is what positive steps can activists possibly take? There are some that I think you can do. They're going to be limited compared to what the real answer is, which is the process of development. But one of them might be so-called ethical branding. So this someone put up on the internet as air sweatshop, basically. You're limited to how many letters you can put on a shoe, though. I'm pretty sure they knew how to spell it. Um, why air sweatshop? So this could be a marketing niche. Of we pay workers, you know, an extra dollar per hour above prevailing standards, or a living wage, or have good working conditions, whatever you want to put in the package. And if that creates extra value in consumers' <coughs> minds, and they're willing to pay for it, well, that's something that can help the workers. So I think, I mean, Air Jordans. Why do people buy Air Jordans? <laughs> Marketing, because you all want to be like Mike, right? Absolutely. Michael doesn't stitch any sneakers. His endorsement creates value in people's minds, subjective value. As a result, they're willing to pay more for the product. Nike pays Michael Jordan a lot of money for that. If people want to buy sneakers specifically because they're made by third world workers, not US workers, and those workers are paid a little better wage, and that creates values in people's minds, this isn't something that risks raising pay above upper bound. It's something that changes upper bound. It brings upper bound up with it because you're creating extra value in people's minds. I think that's something positive on the margin that can be done with an important caveat. You've got to be really careful. So one, this doesn't become a call then for a general law or industry-wide standard. Because in some cases it will create extra value for some people, in other cases it won't. If people don't care extra about it because of it, now you're just doing things that make the labor that makes their product more expensive without making them willing to pay any higher prices. That throws workers into worse alternatives. So it can't be a blanket standard, but it is something that individual companies can explore and if activists want to do something positive, it could be marketing surveys that try to establish which market niches that could be most successful. That's another important caveat. Unfortunately, I think a lot of this is people wanting to feel good without actually doing good. There's a lot of ethical branding that's just a fraud. So it's in fair trade coffee. It's also in sweat free products. So there's a catalog called uh, uh, Buy Sweat Free at the Sweat Free. Shop with a conscience guide. That's right. Shop with a conscience guide. Sweat free products, and they guarantee all products sold on their website have been uh, manufactured in factories where you have the right to organize, good working conditions, and a living wage. 
Here's a map of where all of the factories that supply the products for this shop with the conscience guide are located. <laughs> are we helping poor workers in the third world? You're largely taking away orders from workers in the third world to get rid of their best of their bad alternatives and enriching already wealthy unionized workers in the United States. There's a few factories in Latin America. There is one in Asia. I just didn't want to blow up the whole map to just say there's one factory for all of Asia. Uh, but largely, this is just a scam. So actually, in fact, one role for anti-sweatshop activists, National Labor Committee goes around doing exposés on companies that are exploiting workers. Activists should be running around and going and, ex and ex showing what frauds people like this are and exposing them so that people don't get sucked into what they think is ethical branding when it's really not. Um, beyond that, what else can they do? For starters, buy the products. You don't help people by limiting the demand for their products. So cease doing boycotts or staying away from it. Or you need it, really, you need an anti-buy in the USA campaign. You need a don't buy in the USA campaign if you care about workers. <laughs> Good luck getting mass support for that. But that would at least be something in the right direction. Um, freer trade. Advocate for getting rid of policies that limit the goods from these com countries that can come into our market. Or that put tariffs on them that artificially de uh, depress the productivity of workers who live in these countries. The biggest non-directly trade one in goods and services anyway, though, is immigration. <coughs> you want to make their lives better? Instead of advocating anti-sweatshop policies, advocate pro-immigration policies. The biggest thing you could do for them is get them to move to the United States. So compared to anything that you could hope for with any anti-sweatshop law passed in Haiti, even if it didn't have adverse economic consequences, would be minuscule compared to the gains of moving a Haitian out of Haiti into the United States. They earned orders of magnitude more with better living standards when they did. Why? Because that Haitian, who by the way probably doesn't have white skin, moved into the capital stock and technology that's in the United States, and more importantly, what I'd say is the relatively decent institutional environment that gives people the freedom and stability to contract in ways that makes the best use of that technology and capital that's here. That's, a pro uh, that's the best anti-poverty program you could do generally, never mind sweatshops, for anybody in the third world is push for greater migra migration flows to the United States. Um, some people might respond like, oh, well, that's not economic development for Haiti. Well, who cares? I mean, no one runs around being like, Antarctica doesn't have enough GDP, Antarctica. <laughs> it's penguins, right? <laughs> what we care about is humanity, and when they move from one piece of ground to another and then they can better flourish, that's development as far as I'm concerned. And for what it's worth, the economic evidence on this says that basically as migrants leave a country and come to another one, it doesn't make the country they're leaving any worse off as a result either, so it's not impoverishing the ones who stick behind. It's basically a net bounce up. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, look for uh, Michael Clemens' uh, billion dollar bill left on the sidewalk, the gains from immigra emigration in the world. Uh, the other big one, and this is really hard to do from the outside, actually it's hard to do from the inside, what they really need is institutional reform. These countries are poor because they have poor institutions, namely bad governments with bad systems of law. That's why technology and capital hasn't flown in in mass before, and that's why they don't make good use of what they have. In countries where they're bad enough, these sweatshops might be the highest stage of development they're gonna hit until they get better institutions. They are they're not part of the process that grows out of it, they're just the crust that's least bad, given the bad alternatives. In countries that do get their institutions right, namely securing private property, protecting economic freedoms, that's when you see Hong Kong, the most economically free country in the world, <coughs> Singapore, second most, Korea back when it was growing in the early 1970s was in the top 20% of that index. Those Asian tigers all scored very well on economic freedom. Incidentally, I should mention the author of the best study that measures economic freedom in the world is Professor Jim Wartney, who works here at Florida State University and has a ton of research that's been done with that index. Um, but advocating for reform in that direction, and by the way, free trade's part of that, because you find as a more free country trades as a less free country, they tend to become more free over time. Uh, so these are things that activists could do, but I'd say the last one, and this is important, is first, do no harm. If previously you've been advocating for legal minimum wages, minimum work standard laws, there's something simple you can do to help. Stop. And then consider which of these other activities you'd like to do. At this point, I'd like to open it up for questions, comments, and anything else from all of you. Uh, I promise you the first question, and I'll honor the contract. I appreciate that. Um, I, I guess I wanted to just explain um, when you were coming here. Um, I, I asked Rebecca, and she wasn't sure. That, you know, when, when I brought speakers previously, um, 
you know, I, I had to go through a lot of work to get funding. She did college with libertarians didn't um, are paying for this. Are you coming from the uh, Institute for Men's Studies that is paying for it? Florida, uh, the, the former chair of the Department of Economics handed me a check when I walked in. That's who's paying for it. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Okay, let's jump. Um, how quickly does a modern nation move? Oh, crap. Did you not follow me? That's okay. Go ahead. I'll get her next. <laughs> <laughs> How quickly does it move from a very like third world state to getting a middle class becoming a I guess on the second world what you do? Yeah, so the question, I'll try to repeat questions if they're a little quiet. The question is how quickly does a country move from really poor third world status to having a middle class and stuff? It depends. So it depends on how quickly they improve institutions, what external circumstances are. Uh, punchline though is, if you get good institutions, under most reasonable conditions it would seem like countries seem to do it in about a generation. Uh, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, that's contingent upon getting very good institutions and maintaining them though. Uh, and it can be faster, you know, like if you take a country that's located near major markets and lots of technology and has good international trading capabilities, it might happen faster. One, there's no like rule of thumb. I'm going to get you who's okay. trying to get. Yes. I was wondering um, what would happen when these countries where the work is now become industrialized, or when all the countries of the world are industrialized and, and when they're buying the products. Not even to mention, but I'm going to mention it. Um, the environmental harm that will come from this this increased consumption of the middle class growing throughout the world. Okay. I mean, I, I don't see that as sustainable. What would be your response to that? Well, let me split your question into two parts. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the first part, and this I want to tie to what people will talk about, like the global race to the bottom. So it's like these countries that were poor, they had factories come in, then those factories all, like as labor costs get higher, they like run and go to another poor spot in the world and they keep pop scotching down to poor places. <laughs> Like when people, and I'm not saying that you did this, but as people often describe this, they, it kind of gives you the image of like, oh, they went in, they raped this place, they left, and now went to a new place, and that place has now been left bad off. What happened to Hong Kong and Singapore and South Korea? What happened was, just like in the United States, as the workers became more productive and justified higher and higher pay, it was no longer economical to make these type of goods there, because that scarce labor was better off making higher and more productive goods for people that justified higher pay. So the sweatshops have to go and look for those workers who didn't have as good or alternatives. So as this process trickles, it's like it's more like a run up the ladder, and other countries get on that first ladder of development, which is sweatshops. So then let me finish this part and then I come back to you. The question is, as you go through all the countries in the world, then we hit like this last bunch. And it's like, okay, you're the sweatshop country, you're stuck like that forever. Well, no, because as their productivity rises, they can justify higher pay. Now, if we still desire the types of things that are produced in sweatshops, they still have to be made, but now with more productive labor, it doesn't look like garment production in Guatemala. It looks like garment production in North Carolina. It looks like garment production in Italy. So there's still going to be countries that produce food. There's still going to be countries that produce garments. It's just the level of income and the conditions workers work under can be better. Economic growth in that sense is unlimited. Do you want to follow up on this point or do you want me to do the environmental part? Um, you can go ahead to the environmental Okay, the environmental part. So question <coughs> becomes that as other countries develop, isn't this going to put stress on our global environment? We can't support this higher productivity. Well, as we look at how countries treat their own environment, as they become richer, they generally improve what they do to their environment. Yeah, if you look at poorer countries around the world, the level of environmental problems they have is much greater than what you see in richer countries. What you might resort to is your carbon footprint gets bigger as you become richer. I think that's true, but as we become richer, we're better able to deal with the consequences of having a change in climate that comes from economic development. Ultimately, when people make like a resource argument, the world is running out of X, Actually, I have a two-word phrase I give for most everybody, see if you guys can remember this one. When someone says the world is running out of something, my two-word answer is, first word B, second word S, with an important caveat. As long as the good is private property, we're not going to run out. We're never, ever going to run out of oil, because oil can be privately owned. So what happens as we start running out of it, its price goes up. That means the people who are extracting it, they're making more money from doing so, but since that fact oil is more valuable, it's used for fewer and fewer things. Meanwhile, the entrepreneur who creates an alternative to using oil can make a lot of money by doing so. As a result, we don't run out of it. 
Now, tuna in the ocean, those are unowned. We might run out of those, and in fact, we might run out of those in our lifetimes. I'm really sad about this because I love fatty tuna. Uh, but that we might run out of, so unknown resources. But otherwise, the price system adjusts. So Julian Simon's a famous economist who uh, called human ingenuity basically the ultimate resource, at least constrained within a price system. And when we have that, basically we come up with better ways of doing things. So we had a famous bet with the population bomb guy, Paul Erler, where he said, you pick the resources that we're running out of, I'll bet you 10 years later, the basket of those resources will be cheaper than what they are now, which is a signal that we're not running out of them. He made the bet, he won, he offered to double down, he was not taken up on the offer. Uh, this is the general situation. Yes? Mr. Powell, I just want to say, you had a great dialogue and presentation, I appreciate it. But uh, my question pertains to going up the ladder, going up, you know? And so I'm fascinated by three things. I'm fascinated by simplicity, complexity, and self-reliance, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, when I looked at the Guatemala um, survey, it had all of the, basically I can say these people are logical. They, they're willing to do this effort in order to get this reward. You can look at the Haitian lady, she's willing to go in some dirt and pick up some tin in order to provide for herself. She's willing to do that, she will adapt her environment. Now see, how do you make this sweatshop more economically sound without destroying it, you know? And so I wonder, okay, you have all these employees who work absurd hours. That means they're experiencing so much in this environment. They're probably learning a lot. They're not dumb. They're just like you. And so they just don't know how to be a manager yet. Yeah. But I'm thinking, okay, the main guy that's making all of these, he has the resources, right? That's his capital. That's how, what he's producing, and he's making these people produce these things. I'm thinking, why not take these people, bring them to their own little sex, you know, and have them, like, have quotas that they need to meet for these resources. And they will meet them because she's willing to pick up that tent. They're willing to work 80 hours in absurd <coughs> conditions. People are willing to, and if they're willing to do that, people in their local environment are willing to do some other things. I'm thinking if you get, you almost train these people that you're training to do, to be drones almost. If you train them for something else and use those resources and diversify them, you know, and have quotas to make sure they have the checks and balances. If they're willing to do what they need to do for their well-being, they're going to make that quota, and, or possibly, you know. But so I'm just saying, you can diversify that and want that promote, uh, promote the economic evolution. All right, so the two-part answers here. One, often workers are paid a piece rate, but that doesn't mean that they're being given freedom to innovate in how they make it necessarily, which is what you're talking about. I'm uh, talking about I like having an item in the local environment. Because substitutes are everywhere. I'm talking about like, okay, make this shirt and you have to sell this product in your environment. And if you don't hit this amount of product sold. I, I'm going to say that we don't have to tell them to do any of that. Mm -hmm. If that's what's best for them, they'll already be doing it. How so? Or they'll be learning to do it because if they're seeking out what their best available alternatives are. Now, there might be a role for like, educational groups to go down and point out what people could be doing. There's a role for other entrepreneurs. If you don't think the best use is being made of these people, in terms of how much value they can create for others, go down and start your own factory and create different conditions under which that they labor. Uh, so, it's, And by the way, there is actually like a factory that did this recently, not of the model that you're saying, but it's the kind of darling of the anti-sweatshop movement, the uh, Alta Garcia, Garcia factory uh, in Dominican Republic, and they have... Uh, created a factory there where workers get good working conditions and they market their products as ethically produced and meet these standards, which as far as I can tell, they do meet the standards they advertise, so it's not like the fraud group I showed before. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's perfectly fine. It's part of the market process. Although I will say that shining example of success of the anti-sweatshop movement, what people don't tell in that story is that BJ&B was the factory that used to be there, and they were the target of the anti-sweatshop movement in 2001. That factory employed 2,000 workers. In 2003, it agreed with the anti-sweatshop movement to meet certain conditions. In 2004, it started reneging on those conditions and back and forth went protests and what they were doing to meet the conditions over the next four years until the factory only employed 234 workers in 2007 and went out of business. Alta Gracia is now the company that occupies that village and they employ 134 workers under their ethical conditions. For the other almost 1,800 workers, 1,800 plus workers, there are worse alternatives. Yes? Hi, I have a very straightforward question. Uh, basically, I want to know out of all of the countries employing sweatshops as a viable means of wage, how many of them are actually seeing economic growth? Uh, because you've been mentioning the same four, right? The same four that made it to, you know, first world oh. nations. And so I want to know how, out of how many of those are actually seeing economic growth overall, and how they compare to countries who have not employed sweatshops as a means of wage? 
Yeah, so, uh, the, so those ones that I've been saying, those same four, are the ones that have made the jump because they started it a while ago. Yeah. So if we're looking at this, the current, current groups, look at the growth that's going on in India and China. So part of China's growth is probably a, an illusion, um, but not all. But certainly not all of it as you look at people escaping poverty there. Uh, so China, I mean, is a growth miracle of what's going on there right now. The amount of absolute number of people reduced from poverty over the last decade is probably the highest it's ever been in the history of humanity, and that's mainly the growth of India and China that's doing it. Uh, both of those countries still have low levels of economic freedom and respect for property rights, but importantly, they're two of the biggest improvers in those margins <coughs> over the last 20 years. So uh, China, I think, has made about a 66% improvement in its economic freedom score over the last 20 years, uh, and that brings with it this real growth starts that's happening. India is about a 33% improvement in its economic freedom of memory. <coughs> <laughs> 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 I mean, you have to you know, figure that most of them aren't succeeding in improving their economic conditions, improving their economy. Yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, so we can look at the list, and some of them have better institutions than others. Also, are Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Brazil improving? So, Brazil, yes, but Brazil, by the way, was just like one isolated sweatshop case mm -hmm. there with the Bolivia one. That's probably not a great example. What about Bangladesh and Indonesia? But Bangladesh, yes, Indonesia. As we look at a lot of these countries, growth actually the last decade or so for a lot of poorer countries has been pretty decent in the world. How is this showing growth, though? This isn't showing. No, no, I'm just pulling this up for the, okay. the list of countries. Because uh, I'm, I'm having a hard time being convinced that the, the average value of the economy in other countries is actually being increased. So there's two things that are happening, right? So the why do you have a hard time? So that I, if sweatshops bring in <laughs> technology and capital with them, technology and capital help determine your living standards. You get more of those as a result of having sweatshops. Why wouldn't the expectation be that income should be rising? So that would be my expectation. That said, so all else is not equal. Some of these countries don't have very good institutional environments. Guatemala is one of them. Um, there, sweatshops are your least bad option that you have, but it doesn't. So sweatshops, let me put it this way. I don't want to sell them as like, this is the panacea for growth. It's not. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition. Okay, so just having sweatshops doesn't guarantee you growth. It's a necessary stage of the process of economic development, but it's not sufficient to guarantee it quite. So that what you need is an institutional environment for economic freedom. Is there, any, is there any way that you could say sweatshops might be inhibiting government at some point? Uh, we could make an argument that foreign businesses coming in are corrupting governments to then create bad laws that leave their country impoverished. I think, so in individual instances where that's the case, I think we should protest the corporatist environment that is the capitalist going in and working with the government there. Uh, that should be an object of protest for everybody in this room and elsewhere. Uh, I'd say in general though, the problem is the institution of governance are already bad and corrupt in these countries anyway. It's really not the influence of the Westerners going in now that's making it bad. We might make historical arguments about how bad colonial environments left these countries with bad institutions and poor social capital. I'm sympathetic to that and think it's one of the reasons why they're in a bad situation now. But that doesn't change the argument of going forward of what do we do from here. Take away their least bad option? That doesn't seem right. Yes? I kind of have a two-part question. How would you feel about the issue of national sweatshops? I know there are areas here in Tallahassee with really high unemployment rates. Would you be all right with a sweatshop in Frenchtown, for example, yeah. uh, or a factory fire in Frenchtown that killed 113 people? Well, I'm uh, not a, I'm part not. two my question, part two. <laughs> um, is, uh, the issue of why they are poor. Uh, you mentioned that they are poor because they have, uh, I don't know, poor or defective governments and institutions. But what about, like you just mentioned, the colonial imperialist history? Cambodia, one of your examples, for, uh, for example, the United States had a systematic effort to carpet bomb Cambodia literally for decades. Nicaragua, Reagan had a terrorist war in Nicaragua, overthrew the government, and then had a campaign to impoverish the country. That's a country I have firsthand experience in. So do we not owe something to these countries other than allowing them gracefully to make our shoes for two cents an hour? And also, I do believe it's important that everybody recognize we do have white privilege, and to deny it is just to deny all of our kids. No, it's not a real sport. It's not a real sport. We don't know how to do this. We're in this room. We're a privileged part of society. Just recognize it. It's a fact. I'm not white. You're not white. All right. Hey, hey, hey. We're going to have one person talk at a time. So. I'm not going to touch this white privilege thing. I agree with the point that everybody in this room is privileged because we're living in the United States. Now, the, the larger point that you're making about Cambodia history, these other places, 
I agree with. I don't favor those things that were done in the past. The question is, you said, don't we owe them more? And gracefully lying. Yes. So what more are you suggesting? And let's figure out if it's going to help them or not. If it's on the list of things that I talked about that anti-sweatshop actors do, my argument is that's not helping them. What we're doing is giving them less. We could have a constructive conversation about how might we better promote uh, getting better civil societies in countries that go to better governance. And that's fine and be part of the conversation. Overall, I'm not very optimistic about the U.S. or anybody else's ability to transplant institutions from one place and give it to somebody else. I think the record of doing that militarily is horrible. Uh, and that the record for doing it through foreign aid is horrible. So I'm not really sure what can be done. But as long as you're not talking about the list of things that I went through, I don't object to it necessarily. Let's have a constructive conversation about what else can be done. What about national search jobs? Oh. Uh, if you would like, so let's say we could ignore the laws in the United States. If you would like to start a factory and offer the terms that you could get, say, in Sam Bridge or Nicotex, uh, I think you should be free to offer it. I suspect that you will not find very many employees. So you don't believe in a minimum wage, then? Is that what you're saying? Um, I mean, I believe it exists, but I don't believe it should exist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm going to give you one second. Minimum wage in the United States, right? It's a political thing that gets kicked around a lot but we don't see very much unemployment caused by it. Where you do see it is on minority youths particularly, and youths generally, but particularly minority youths. It's the people who are right around that being within those bounds of where they usually get paid in the market. The vast majority of people, I think 97.5% in the United States, earn more than it. So it's something that's largely symbolic because the market carrying wage would be above it anyway. So if we got rent of the minimum wage, you wouldn't see very much difference in the United States. It's not the wage doing it. It's basically, like I said about those other things, it's codifying what existing market conditions would give you anyway. Thanks. Yes. Um, just as a side note, I think that, um, and this is coming from someone that has a very progressive background, as so far as my beliefs are, I think that the way you're marketed is somewhat uh, divisive, uh, in that I think we're actually in agreement on a number of points, uh, a lot of the people in this room. I was hoping but, by the end would be an agreement on all of them. Well, <laughs> I think that we're, a lot of us are, you know, on, on many of your points, but uh, I think the way it's marketed is sweatshops is the good and wonderful thing. It, it ends up causing a little bit of tension, uh, just in the way you're promoted. So, um, but I wanted to ask you, uh, and I apologize, I have to write down every question I do because I just lose my train of thought entirely if I don't. Uh, so in some of your articles, you list the years that varying countries went through their sweatshop phase. Um, the U.S. and Britain, you quote, like about 150 years, and uh, some Asian countries like Japan, you say about 30. Um, and you say yourself that anti-sweatshop movements are less in vogue with groups concerned with workers' rights and worker safety. Uh, it's moving away from, from that kind of focus. I'm sorry. Oh, you said in the lecture that you, that a lot of these groups are moving away from just <coughs> focusing on anti-sweatshop uh, uh, application uh, and, and moving towards a general concern of um, how the overall safety levels of a country it, is, uh, is seen. They're moving away from boycotts. Well, I don't know about that's what else. I mean, by okay. anti-sweatshop application. Uh, Anti-boycott, rather. Okay. Uh, so, pardon. Uh, okay. So, now, rather than kind of promoting yourself as uh, saying, you know, the best of the worst are, are fantastic, why not encourage uh, the best available options that resemble um, the kind of economic aid that we gave Japan after World War II. I mean, they moved out of their uh, sweatshop phase in 30 years, which is much faster than what happened in the U.S. and Britain. And you know, when we were in our sweatshop phase, we didn't have an America to come and help us and lift us out of that state. Uh, everyone was in the sweatshop phase at that point. So why not kind of use that same sort of uh, method for helping these countries that are stuck in their sweatshop phase? Right. I mean, you can argue as, gotcha. so as the overall um, level of, of living raises for the world as a whole, the sweatshop phase is less necessary, and you can shorten it as much as possible. I, don't, I won't say less necessary, but it can be shorter in terms of duration. So let me clarify something first. I don't want to represent of saying that these alternatives are quote fantastic or anything like that. I was actually I was on Penn and Teller's TV show one time, uh, bullshit, uh, discussing sweatshops, and the way Penn phrased it was, working in a sweatshop may suck, 
but it's better than tilling the soil of grandpa's femur. Oh, uh, absolutely. I've so I'm not saying these are fantastic yeah. options, they're bad That's options. Um, so this latter one, the Japan thing is a rather unique circumstance. Um, of Japan and Germany both who had a capital stock that was built up before a war had a different social capital and a level of development that got crunched severely in a war and then grew rapidly afterwards. I could make a long argument about like, why the Marshall Plan in Europe uh, wasn't beneficial for their development, uh, but either way we're talking about a sample of N equals 2 here. If we look at the track record of generally exporting institutions and capital through development programs to the poor parts of the world over the last 50 years, it's a disaster. Uh, so I wouldn't extrapolate from the, Japan's experience that anything like that should be done for any other countries today. You've been waiting patiently, yes? Um, well, I, I'm still really trying to understand how you frame your research. It kind of seems like your aim is to be an apologist, and it doesn't really seem terribly uh, constructive, even though you, 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 know, you acknowledge a lot of criticisms um, that, you know, that you feel are problematic. But um, sort of where you're going with this um, doesn't seem really geared towards criticizing the problems that you agree are problematic. You, you seem to be more criticizing the critical culture um, that's, that sort of is against sweatshops. I mean, it seems, it seems to sort of be an apologist, and, that, and that's fine, and, and there's plenty of good work to do in that. Um, but but I, I would love to have heard more of, you know, your, uh, like you, you wait from the very end to mention the Workers' Rights Consortium and, and Alta Gracia, and I think that could have been the stuff of an incredibly um, much more rich discussion that would have a lot more common ground with people who are critical and people who are uh, not so critical. Um, but my, my question to you is, you said something that was the substance of a big part of your talk, and it was the trade-off between wages and conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and I really feel like that's kind of a false choice, because to say that workers should have to choose between wages and conditions, you're kind of assuming that these institutions or these manufacturing companies should come in and not acknowledge any kind of, uh, you know, uh, global standard of human rights. You're saying, well, if they're going to have to work on conditions, it's going to have to come out of the worker's paycheck. And so I feel like the idea that there's a trade-off inherently, you, you kind of just ran with that assumption, and it seems like a false choice with a problematic underlying assumption. Okay, so let me just, let's, shoulds and have tos are different things. So should workers have to make a trade-off? Maybe in some cosmic injustice sense we could say, no, they shouldn't. The problem is, in the world we live in, they do. So we could say, all firms must respect, so actually I debated a, a business ethics guy at Georgetown this December on this topic, and this was basically the position he took, was you're not obligated to go into the third world and work with poor 